Well, good evening, everyone who is joining us here this evening for the uh, April 2021 monthly meeting of the Minnesota Woodworkers Guild. Uh, we've got uh, 70 of you online already. Uh, that's really good. So uh, my name is Ed Noy. I'm president of the Guild. Uh, I'm supported by a, a group of uh, a board of directors. Uh, we haven't been able to actually meet our board of directors very much uh, during these virtual meetings, but uh, they're always out there. And you can, you can find them listed on the internet. Excuse me, my friend. One of those junk phone calls on the other phone there. Sorry about that. Anyway, you can always you can find their names on the uh, contacts page of our website. If you ever need to call them or uh, email them, uh, their contact information is out there. Uh, as you enter the uh, meeting here, you're automatically put on mute, and we ask that everyone remain on mute. Uh, with this many people on the on the call, we've got uh, 75 so far. Uh, it gets to be a little bit hectic with a lot of people trying to, to, to chime in. So what we would ask you to do in, in, instead, uh, Zoom has a, a, a textual chat feature. Uh, if you have any questions uh, that we'd like to pose to the presenters uh, or comments, please post them in the chat section. And uh, Amelia Kennedy and I will be monitoring that and uh, we'll, we'll try to make things good. Uh, at the end of the formal presentation, uh, we'll open it up and anybody who uh, wants to chime in with questions or problems or whatever, uh, we can manage that. Uh, in addition, uh, we like to give our members an opportunity to, to share work that they've got going on in their shops right now or to pose particular questions. And uh, we'll do that right at the end of uh, this business section before we start the presentation at seven o'clock. If you have something you would like to uh, ask or like to show and share, uh, please send a chat message and uh, we'll make sure we uh, make some time for that. Uh, let's see. I'm seeing just an awful lot of names that I've never seen before. Now, I have to admit, I'm not really great on names, but uh, I've noticed that with these uh, virtual meetings we've been having for the past year, uh, we're getting a lot of new people involved with the Guild and we really think that's great. And I'm sorry I don't have uh, an opportunity for you to all introduce yourselves, but uh, soon, hopefully in the next few months, we'll be able to get back to in-person meetings and you can actually uh, uh, look at people in the face and shake their hands and talk to them and, and we can all share some uh, good information and good fellowship. Uh, this month of April, we do not have a sponsor of the month. If you go to our sponsors page, you'll notice that. But we uh, will have a sponsor of the month coming up in May. Keep your eyes open for that because there'll, there'll be some sort of a special deal or special promotion. Um, let's see. Uh, Ron Austin. Ron, are you on the, on the meeting? And if so, would you unmute yourself? and uh, give a shout out about the tool swap that's coming up. I didn't see Ron's name pop up when I- uh... I saw his name. Yeah, he's on there. There you are. Yeah, I'm- Yes, I'm, I'm here. <laughs> Very good, um... fill us in. <laughs> um, we are planning the tool swap for 2021. Um, it's September 18th. It's going to be at the Bloomington Armory. Um, we um, are working on our presenters. At this point, we have three presenters confirmed. Um, it's Alex Snodgrass. We'll talk about bandsaws. It is Dijinsky. I think it's um, Mark Dijinsky. Um, he will be talking about jigs and fixtures. Um, he has several patents on jigs and fixtures. I believe he has a background with Craig, um, the, the pocket uh, screw uh, jigs, uh, among other things. And uh, third uh, would be um, 
George Wurzel. He um, is a woodworker who has lost his sight. So uh, kind of a very inspirational uh, speaker that we'll have. And um, we, we have feelers out for one more speaker uh, that we haven't heard from and, and a fifth one declines. But uh, so anyway, we have three really good speakers right now working on possibly a fourth and then uh, focusing on uh, getting uh, the name brand tools in the expo portion of the uh, of the show. Um, we're, we're confident that we'll have many of them there. And then also out in the parking lot, we'll be having the, the, the tool swap portion where we ask you if you have uh, tools or lumber you want to, to get rid of, um, to bring it on into the parking lot and, uh, and uh, try your luck at, at, at selling it. Um, so that's, that's an update. We're, we're hoping and we're, we're a little bit confident that we'll, we'll be okay with this COVID thing. So, but we, we still are monitoring that situation. Very fine. Thank you very much, Ron. Uh, the next big event we've got coming up is uh, our Northern Woods exhibition, our quote annual, except for last year. And it's, us it's usually been held in the spring. Uh, uh, Charlie Kosorik is uh, chairman of the committee that's uh, responsible for that. I, I do not see that Charlie's online, so we'll, we'll talk to it just a little bit. It will be the, uh, the second weekend in October. At, uh, that's not the spring. Uh, we all agreed quite a while back that the spring, which is right now, was uh, just still yeah, too risky uh, with respect to the virus going around. And uh, we, we were able to secure the second week in October, uh, again at the Eden Prairie uh, Center. So please be working on uh, woodwork projects that you uh, could uh, exhibit at the show. Uh, we're hoping that uh, people during this pandemic have had gobs of time to work in their shops and uh, come up with some really uh, great stuff to show. Uh, the other thing uh, we've got uh, coming up in the fall is our annual fall seminar. Uh, Richard Tendick and uh, Bob Krabby are working on that. Uh, let's see, I don't see Richard. Bob, I did see you on the, uh, on the attendance list. Would you like to talk about the uh, fall seminar? Um. Yeah, we're uh, scheduled for November. We still have to talk to our presenter. It'll be Owen Harris to lock down the date. Um, uh, he was potentially thinking the first weekend in November and it'll be held at St. Paul College. Great, what, what, do, you, what do we think he's gonna, Owen's gonna talk about? Um, we know that there was a Demi-Loon table that he's designed and built. So that'll be uh, one of the topics for sure. Very good. Yeah, so as soon as we get the date nailed down with him, we'll uh, get a notice out to everybody and hopefully we'll be have, able to have a nice fall seminar this year. Uh, thanks, Bob. Uh, regarding announcements, uh, as we've been doing uh, during this past year with our virtual meetings, uh, the meeting is being recorded uh, and uh, with permission from the folks here at the Gamble House, we will be re, uh, posting this on our YouTube channel uh, per usual. Uh, so you'll see that uh, coming up next week. We'll uh, uh, put a notice out on our meetings webpage uh, uh, that uh, when it's up and posted. Two other things, uh, we've been uh, active in the past few months uh, with the support of my board of directors and we've been engaging a higher level of involvement with a couple of the uh, maker spaces in the metropolitan area. Uh, we are just about ready to announce a program with Minneapolis Make. Uh, what we'll be doing is we will be offering a six month uh, paid uh, scholarship uh, to a student to attend, to, to use the facilities of Minneapolis Make uh, to work on projects. Uh, and uh, so that will be announced here shortly. And just today we put up on our website, if you go to the classes page, uh, the, uh, the makerspace we uh, visited uh, 
a few months ago, TC Make. Uh, we, we're embarking on a program with them. TC Make has a need uh, for uh, uh, educated folks in woodworking to uh, teach classes at their facility. So what we're gonna do is uh, we're gonna send out an email to all of our members, uh, inviting them to uh, act as instructors. Uh, these are paid positions. The instructors will determine the uh, fees that the students uh, will be required to pay. And 10% uh, of that fee uh, will be returned to the Minnesota Woodworkers Guild to be put in our scholarships fund. Uh, you know, we do have uh, uh, two scholarships that we give out annually for people, for members to attend uh, woodworking schools. And now we have this uh, other program with Minneapolis Make uh, that uh, we are sponsoring. And uh, that will, the TC Make uh, activity will help fund that opportunity. Uh, next on the agenda here is door prizes or uh, uh, swag or whatever we want to call it. Uh, since we've been meeting virtually, we haven't been able to actually give away hardware, which everyone likes to see. But we have been giving away uh, $25 gift certificates to either uh, Woodcraft of Minneapolis or Rockler. And this past month, for the month of March, we sent gift cards to the following. Uh, Keith Engelhart, Dale Holland, Ron Corridan, <clears throat> David Samba Samborski, Lawrence Weisner, Steve Godeke, Hans von Sluten, Brad Hansen, and John Siegfried. And at the close of this meeting, we will uh, download the list of participants and throw that into the computer and do a big shuffle on it and come up with uh, 10 randomly selected, selected folks uh, to send gift cards to this month. Uh, at this time, okay, um, at this time, I, no one has uh, asked for any uh, time to um, present anything that's on their bench. And I see it is just about seven o'clock. So um, I think Amelia Kennedy, why don't I turn it over to you? You can introduce our program, please. Yes, welcome everybody. Um, I have, I'm very excited to introduce our presenters from the Gamble House Conservancy. And I'm sure you've all read the introduction that was on our, um, our uh, Minnesota Woodworkers Guild um, site. So I won't go through that again, um, except to say that this house for me really looks like a fine piece of furniture at a extremely large and complex scale. <laughs> the joinery, everything, it just looks like uh, the same care and craft that would go into a piece of furniture has been done to this entire house. Um, so I think you'll all enjoy that. Um, our, two, um, our two guides tonight are uh, Jennifer Michelle, who is the tour and education manager. And she won't be speaking, but she'll be um, helping us see some um, some great views, up close views of items. And then Robert Simminger is the, um, I don't know that I have his title exactly, but he is the head docent. He teaches all the other docents <laughs> how to do the job. I'm a um, volunteer. A vo and, and he's a volunteer, exactly. Um, so please welcome Jennifer and Robert. I'll turn it over to Robert. Thanks very much, folks. Um, welcome, I'm going to, uh, do a screen share here, uh, I hope. Okay, and aren't I? Okay, what just happened? And why isn't this working? Of course. We can't see your screen, so we can't help. No, I know. Uh, <laughs> let, me, let me try this one more time. Hang on just a second. I'm terribly sorry. All right. 
We can see you and we also see that there's another um, connection that just shows your name. Yes, that's behind me and let me There we go. All right. You should now see the front of the Gamble House. Is that correct? Correct. All right. Well, welcome everybody to sunny Southern California, Pasadena. You're standing in front of the, the Gamble House. The Gamble House was built for David and Mary Gamble. Um, David Gamble of the Procter and Gamble Company. David's father was one of the co-founders of Procter and Gamble. The, um, the Gambles had visited Pasadena many times in the past. I see it says I am muted. Is that correct? I can hear you. Okay, the sign just popped up and said I was muted. Um, so David Mary Gamble had visited Pasadena many times in the past. And when David Gamble, who had worked his whole life for Procter & Gamble, decided to retire, um, they decided to build a, a, a basically a winter home in Southern California. And that in 1907, they contracted with the local architectural firm of Green & Green. That's Charles and Henry Green. Charles and Henry were brothers and established their practice here in Pasadena in uh, 1893. By 1907, they were known for their craftsman style architecture. And um, David Mary Gamble totally embraced the, the style and the philosophy of craftsman architecture. So what you see is the best preserved example of their architecture. Now I say preserved, not restored, because this house has not been restored. What you're going to see is, is almost entirely original. Um, the architects not only designed the house and the landscaping, they designed almost all of the furniture in the house, the light fixtures, the andirons, the switch plates, the entire package. The house stayed in the Gamble family until 1966 when it was deeded to the city of Pasadena for the public to enjoy. And because it stayed in the family, it was never ever altered. Um, the um, the view you're looking at is from the front of the house that sits on a private street called Westmoreland Place. There are only six homes along this street, and this is number four, Westmoreland Place. The architects and the, uh, the owners both uh, totally embraced the idea of the automobile. Now, this is in 1908. Totally embraced the idea of the automobile and fully expected guests to arrive at the house via the automobile. You may notice that there are no walkways from the street to the house. You're expected to drive up the driveway and disembark at these very wide front steps. In this view, you can also see off to the right and at a much lower elevation is the garage. Uh, we'll talk about the garage a little bit later. I'm going to uh, take us up to the front steps here. And now we're tur turned around looking back at the direction we just um, were standing at. Um, you can see this beautiful curved brick driveway um, circles from Westmoreland Place around in front of the stairs and back out to Westmoreland Place again. Um, as, I, as I rotate around, you'll be able to see some of the very um, typical features of green and green architecture along overhanging eaves and, and extended rafter tails. Now the long overhanging eaves, of course, protect the house from the sun during the summer. It can get pretty toasty here in Pasadena. Um, those rafter tails that stick out cast spectacular shadows all across the house. I've forgotten there are well over a hundred of those rafter tails around the house. Um, so this is kind of the vocabulary of, of Charles and Henry Green at this time. You can see that the house is clad in um, redwood, split redwood shakes. They're hand split. Those shakes are 37 inches long. There's only 11 inches exposed. 
So any given spot on a house, there are at least three shakes deep, provides a lot of thermal um, protection for the house. And as I rotate around, you can see an interesting feature here, the, the window and door headers extend out, um, accentuating the horizontal line. Now, and in, in to further accentuate that, that front door, that huge front door is, only, is four and a half feet wide. You know, a typical front door is three feet. So this is four and a half feet wide, but it's only six foot four inches high. And that's not because the gambles were short or anything. It's just the architects wanted to emphasize the low horizontal line. That, that front door assembly is all dark Burma teak. And I know it looks quite light here, but you know, you'd be a little bleached out too if you spent 112 years facing the morning sun every day. Um, we'll see from the inside that teak is, of course, much darker from the inside where it's protected. The Japanese style lantern with the number four, of course, is the address, number four Westmoreland Place. That front door, in addition to the center front door, which is the main pedestrian access, it's flanked by two smaller doors that are screened. Now those doors can be opened and it provides for ventilation through the first floor of the house. I'm going to talk about ventilation a lot as we go through the house. Charles and Henry Green's father was a physician and he specialized in respiratory ailments. So as young men, those, the, the brothers grew up understanding the importance of good ventilation and the relationship of good ventilation to good health. So let me go on, take you inside. Now we're standing with our back to the front door. So we're looking straight through the house, through the first floor entry hall. I'll rotate around and we'll take, we'll do 360 degree view of this. But the double doors at the far end of the entry hall uh, are also screened. They can be open to provide great cross ventilation in the summertime. Um, as you, on, just to the right of those double doors, you'll see an opening that leads into the living room to the left of the front doors, you can just barely see into the dining room. We'll go into all of these rooms before we're done. The wood paneling in here in the entry hall is all dark Burma teak. Up to what you see, there's a rail, horizontal rail that runs around the room. Everything below that is dark Burma teak. The flooring throughout the house is quarter sawn white oak, three quarter inch thick, quarter sawn, tongue and groove, white oak. In the first floor, it's run diagonally, actually in a chevron pattern. And on the second floor, it is running parallel with the walls. Second floor being a little bit less elaborate, it's the family space. So as I rotate around the room, try not to make you seasick here, you can see the, the teak paneling. The furniture that you, you see in the entry hall are two of these large uh, high back chairs uh, the, all the furniture that you're seeing here is crafted by, uh, I mean, uh, designed by Charles and Henry Green and crafted by the Hall brothers. And I'm mentioning the Hall brothers now because they played a huge uh, part in the creation of this house. Charles and Henry Green, of course, being the architects, designed just everything you see. The Hall brothers, um, uh, Peter Hall, Another set of brothers, as I said, Peter Hall was the general contractor for the house. John Hall was responsible for the furniture and all of the finished woodwork in the house. So between these two sets of brothers, they sort of challenged each other. The Hall brothers were able to execute all of the designs that the Greens came up with. And the Greens, maybe they, they decided it was a game to see what they could design that maybe the Hall brothers couldn't create. That didn't happen. So it's wound up as spectacular uh, design. On either side of the chair, the two panels, the one on the right of the chair is actually a touch panel. If you pushed it, it pops open. Um, and it, it uh, is access to a small little vestibule. Uh, off of that vestibule is a, a staircase going down to the full basement. On the opposite side of the vestibule is a door that opens into the kitchen space so that the staff can come through that, that panel, answer the front door and literally disappear back into the woodwork. On the left of the, the, the chair 
is another touch panel that opens and reveals a coat closet. Now, both of these doors have, have relatively current touch type latches. Um, it, originally, they were um, electrically operated. There were little black buttons on either side of those, those vertical pieces. And you'd push the button and the, uh, the, hear a buzzing sound and the door would pop open. But those, those have since broken and, and been replaced by much simpler touch latches. The, notice the, the door header creates this band that not only goes around this room, but every room in the house we refer to that as a picture rail. There's actually a, a groove at the top of it. And I'll show you examples of where they can hang uh, artwork, uh, mirrors, so forth, hung from leather straps and bronze hooks that can hook onto that picture rail so they can be moved virtually anywhere in the house without driving nails or screws into the walls. The plaster between that picture rail and the ceiling um, and the ceiling itself is covered with a fine excuse me, <clears throat> a fine fabric, a material called Sanitis, S-A-N-A-T-I-S. Uh, that was troweled into the plaster when the plaster was still wet. And then finally, that was ultimately painted. And the purpose of that is, is to hide cracks. Plaster is going to crack. I don't care how well you work it and how well it's backed, it's ultimately going to crack. But the Sanitis prevents the cracks from opening up. And so, um, you know, over the years, uh, you can see what look like little trails on the ceiling, but there's no open crack. As I rotate around, the, the open door leads to the only bedroom on the first floor. We'll visit that in a little bit. And as I rotate around to take a look at that front door that we saw from the outside, you can see this great image of a Japanese black pine. It spans not only the front door, but the two side ventilation doors and the clear story above. So uh, art glass is a huge part of the design of this house. The, uh, the design was created by uh, Charles and Henry Green, probably Charles Green. Um, Charles was probably the more creative and Henry was more of the engineer between the two. So between the two of them, they really balanced each other. Um, then it was in the door was crafted, at least the art glass, glass was crafted by a fellow named Emil Lang. He was with the sturdy Lang uh, art glass studio here in Los Angeles. Not only crafted the front door, but the, the Asian lantern that you see uh, directly above. It's a little hard to see, but you can barely make out there is a, a crane, an image of a crane with a rose in its mouth. That's part of the Gamble, Gamble family crest. And you'll see that all through the house as well. As I rotate around and you can take a look at the stairs. Now, uh, sometimes architects decide they wanna hide the stairs, not here. Boy, look at this. Um, they decided to celebrate this whole stair structure. Keep in mind, this is all dark Burma teak. Um, the handrails rather than diagonal handrails are carved to mimic the treads and risers of the stairs. And so each run of the handrail is a single piece of solid mahogany. Um, at each riser, the vertical portion of the stairs is the, the, the beginning of one of those horizontal uh, teak planks. And those planks are also held in place by uh, 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 rectangular teak pegs. And I'll show you a close up of that in a minute. Also below the stairs are built in benches, built in seating. Um, the, the seats lift up, provide storage. And you can see in the foreground, there's marble inset into the, um, the, the teak structure, so um, they can display plants uh, without damaging or the risk of damaging with the, the wood. Um, and you notice the third run of stairs uh, where it returns back toward us. The underside of the stairs, rather than just being a, say, a diagonal plaster plane, is finished exactly the same as the stairs were finished on top. So it creates not only an interesting um, design element, but as you walk down underneath it, um, the ceiling height reduces and, and there's a door back there that leads into Mr. Gamble's den, his private office. And of course, we'll visit that as well. Um, hanging from the, um, the staircase is a bronze incense burner. It's a Japanese crane. And I'll show you a detail of it here. That, that crane has been in the family for quite a while. It was hanging in their Cincinnati uh, 
house. By the way, Cincinnati continued to be their primary residence. They only came out here um, in the winters. And you can imagine that the winters in Southern California, particularly Pasadena, had to be a whole lot better than winters in, in Cincinnati and the Ohio Valley. Um, so they, they would spend winters out here. But you can see that that crane, which had been hanging in their Cincinnati house at the bottom of the stairs on the first floor, um, is actually uh, held in place uh, by metal strapping that is uh, uh, part of the structure that, um, of the stairs above. So that, that crane had to have been put in during the construction. It was this kind of forethought between um, the, the Gambles and particularly Mary Gamble and the architects that really out, are outstanding part of the design of this house. You can see also the structure. Every single piece of wood in the house has been rounded over. There's not a sharp corner anywhere in the house. Um, so this is everything you're looking at here is solid teak. Um, the little pegs that you see next to the incense burner, the crane, um, are, are to hang your hat on. You know, people wore hats back then. Um, not so much today. I do because I burst into flames out in the sun. But um, so I appreciate things like, like hat hooks. And uh, as we, let me get out of this. Okay. There we go. As we rotate around, it's a good place to look at the, uh, the banister, the handrail, uh, all of the, uh, um, the structure that is part of this big stair assembly and the, the marble insets where we can uh, uh, display plants. We'll move on into the living room a few steps along the way. And as I rotate around, I'll let you take a quick look at the living room. The, um, the furniture in here is all mahogany with ebony pegs and splines. Most of the ebony pegs are actually covering brass screws, but not every peg. Some of them are simply decorative to, to create a, a pattern, but um, none of the fasteners are, are visible. And of course, it's one thing to make a round peg, but every single peg in, in every piece of furniture and every piece of wall paneling has been carved square. Uh, and all the pegs actually stand proud of the surface. The, the, the rugs you see here, there are five of these rugs in the living room. They were all um, hand woven in Bohemia after a watercolor sketch by Charles Green. Um, one of the rugs I'll show you in a minute is on display at the Huntington Library in, in San Marino, uh, part of a green and green exhibit we have there. As I rotate around the room, you can see the light fixtures from the ceiling are act, um, act as indirect lighting. They were again designed by the architects and crafted by both um, the Hall brothers, the wood portion of the light fixture by the Hall brothers and the art glass by uh, Sturdy Lang Art Studio. The uh, fireplace ingle nook, um, above the ingle nook is this great truss that spans from one side to the other. It's a queen post truss. Queen post truss because it's got two, two vertical posts. And that shape where it, that S shape that, that lifts up on one side and drops back down on the other is a theme that's used everywhere in the house. If you look at the back of the sofa, it has that lift pattern. We call it a lift pattern or cloud lift. It's on the back of the chairs. It's on the face of the piano. Sometimes it's inverted, it's, it's upside down. Um, it is on the um, horizontal window, mu window muttons. Um, it is everywhere in the house. The ingle nook has uh, built-in bench seating on either side of it, uh, art glass cabinet doors uh, on bookcases, and then the fireplace. The fireplace is uh, the surround is uh, all groovy tile. The architects designed um, the, the fender, the andirons, and all the fireplace implements that, that go along with the, the, uh, the fireplace. So I rotate around, you can see the piano. Now the, the rug that's off to the right, 
the plain rug is, uh, is a replacement. The one that was there is the one that I said is on display at the Green and Green Gallery at the Huntington Library. Uh, this is where the, our guests would stand when we give tours. So we, we wouldn't want them standing on those original rugs. Um, those, those original rugs are one of a kind. They, they were designed and made for this house. There are no others. So they're, they're pretty special. There are a couple of nice Tiffany lamps, a small one um, on, on the uh, top of the piano. That piano was designed by the architects, crafted by the Hall brothers here in Pasadena. Then it was shipped to, to Cincinnati, Ohio, to, uh, to the Baldwin Piano Company, had the innards put in and shipped back to Pasadena. Now this is in 1908 when ground transportation certainly wasn't anything like it was today. You couldn't call FedEx or, or anybody else to come, UPS to come pick it up. It was shipped by train all the way back uh, to Cincinnati and then back again. So I can imagine it took quite a long time for it to actually uh, arrive in working condition. The in, I've seen the piano disassembled when we had it tuned and inside it is spectacular. I wish we had a detailed photo of the inside of it. So as I rotate around, you can see above the door header and that picture rail that runs around the room is a carved redwood frieze that depicts nature scenes, birds, clouds, trees. Um, and as I rotate around, you get kind of get a better view of it. I'm going to change positions here and rotate to the family. So on the left are David and Mary Gamble for whom the house was built. As I said, David Gamble worked for the Procter and Gamble company until his retirement. Uh, on the right are Cecil and Louise Gamble. Cecil was one of their three sons and it's the uh, heirs of Cecil and Louise that um, had enough foresight to give the house as a gift to the city of Pasadena. They actually had put the house up for sale. It was at the time um, in the, the early 60s, late 50s, early 60s, um, these big houses became sort of a, a maintenance nightmare and, and uh, they fell from favor. And so they had put the house up for sale a number of times. The sales fell through, fortunately, uh, the family decided to, to keep it um, and, uh, and allow the, the public to enjoy it. So I'm going to rotate back around again and we'll exit. By the way, Ed if, uh, or Amelia, if you receive any questions via the chat capability, um, please, and, and I'm in the room, please don't hesitate to ask. I'll be glad to answer them while I'm in the room. Otherwise, we'll have a question and answer session at the end of this. Right. So far, there's no questions in the chat room, but All right. I'm, I'm, I'm watching. Either they've gone to sleep or I'm doing OK. No, I think they're enthralled. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're, we're we ultimately will be heading into the dining room that you can see through that open door. But here's a good example of how uh, art pieces are hung from the picture rail. This is a Rookwood plaque. Now, Rookwood, if, if for those who don't know, Rookwood is a um, ceramics company uh, out of Cincinnati. And so it stands to reason that Mary Gamble, who lived in Cincinnati, owned some pieces of Rookwood. It was quite expensive back then. It is outrageous today. This is a one of a kind plaque. It's the only one that was ever made this size with this, this hand painted scene on it. Then it has a, a, a frame by the architects. It's, it's hung from leather straps and those little bronze hooks. So this could be picked up and, and moved anywhere in the house. Right around the corner where the light is shining on the floor is, is the entrance to the kitchen. But where we're going to the left, uh, to, I mean, excuse me, to the left is the kitchen. Where we're going is to the right into the dining room. And I'll show you a very close up of a wall. <laughs> As I rotate around, this room is spectacular. I'll just start from the right and kind of work my way to the left. Again, you can see the chevron pattern floor. Um, and, and you may notice that that chevron pattern 
starts at each of the walls and, and uh, um, finishes in the center underneath the carpet, unfortunately. I've seen the, the floor without the carpet on it, and it's pretty spectacular when you see that chevron coming from four different directions. Keep in mind that flooring, that quarter sawn white oak flooring, tongue and groove, is three quarters of an inch thick. It's not the three sixteenths that you find at Home Depot today. It's this is, you can walk through this house and the floor never squeaks. The rug on the floor was old when it was put down here 112 years ago. It's one of the, the few things like the rugs in the living room that we never walk on um, trying to preserve it. The art glass window at the far end of the room above the built-in uh, sideboard uh, depicts a trailing rose pattern. Um, it, uh, it's an exterior window. The upper small upper panels of that art glass window are operable so they can open for provide for ventilation. And there's a double door right behind where we're standing that opens out onto the rear terrace to provide cross ventilation as well. The light fixture above the table looks like it raises and lowers. It does not. It's hung from leather straps. Um, today, it's got uh, some safety wires in there, some stainless steel wiring, because leather does, of course, dry out. And uh, came in one day, and the fixture was precariously hanging from three straps above that table. Um, and so very quickly, we decided to to reinforce all the leather, replace the leather and reinforce it with stainless steel wires that are pretty much invisible. The table is set up right now to seat four people. The, uh, it can be expanded by adding five leaves in the center of the table to enough to seat 14 people. Um, the base of the table never moves, however. You see the, the long legs on the base uh, actually provide great stability when that table is, is spread out. Those five leaves are stored in the butler's pantry, which is behind the door, kind of right behind the table, just to the right of the fireplace. There's a door that's open with an art glass window in it. And in the butler's pantry, there's a closet. These leaves are stored vertically in beautiful felt lined slots. The advantage of having the same people design your house as, and, and the furniture, they can accommodate so you don't have to put the leaves for the table underneath your bed in the bedroom. Um, the, um, the fireplace uh, picks up the floral pattern that you see in the art glass window. There's also a Tiffany bowl on the center of the table, a fern bowl that has uh, that floral pattern. That's a trailing rose pattern. And so you'll see it uh, inlaid into the tile surround by the fireplace. What you can't see is the andirons also have that same trailing rose pattern. The little white things that you see in the fireplace are ceramic briquettes. Now this, this fireplace and all of the fireplaces in the house uh, were designed as gas fireplaces. They were never intended to burn wood. So the gas fire, gas flame would heat the ceramic briquettes. And then even long after the, the gas was turned off, those briquettes would radiate the heat out into the room. However, the primary heat source for the house was a coal fired furnace down in the basement. And you can see just to the left of the fireplace, one of the floor grates uh, for that gravity feed, gravity flow heating system. There were dampers all throughout the house that you could open and close to adjust the heat. Jennifer, are, are you ready to show the dining table? Oh, I am. Okay, I am, there she is. <laughs> All right, do you want me to stop screen sharing here? Yes. Okay, I'm going to stop this. And, and then you need to be on showcase, right? That's right. There you go. So what you're looking at, Jennifer's up there um, with the sun streaming in. Sorry, folks, <laughs> it's still sunny here. Um, the, the end of the dining table. And Jennifer, if you can lower down to see the mechanism at the end. Now this is a, a mechanism designed by the architects, jointly between the architects and the Hall brothers, the, the, the folks that crafted this table. It's also a good way, a good place to look at the base of the table. 
So Jennifer, can you pull that table out, pull out the leaves? Now look at this, she's using two fingers to do this. This table is 112 years old and it slides out beautifully. You can see the, 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 the cantilever, if, if you can show from underneath. Now the table is all mahogany with ebony pegs and splines. There you go. So each side can be pulled out far enough to add five leaves to the center of the table. I've seen Jim Apexi, and some of you may know Jim. He's a nationally known woodworker, cabinet maker, furniture maker. He gives special tours here at the Gamble House. And he has pulled this table out with one hand held from the side of the table, not pulling straight toward him but standing at the side of the table, pulling it out. And it, it, after 112 years, it pulls out beautifully, does not rack, uh, does not hesitate. And you wanna push that back in again. Beautiful. There's the underside. And you can see the, uh, the me mechanism that allows the table to slide. The little black dots are ebony pegs, even under the table, covering the screws. I, ha I hate it when the screws, screws are exposed, so. Beautiful. So it, in order to pull out the other side, you walk around to the other side. The, each, each side works independently. And as I said, um, with five leaves in it, the base never moves, never changes. Um, notice the, uh, the pegs as the two leaves of the table come together, of course, are, are ebony, contrasting, um, nice hardwood pegs, so they're not, not gonna get damaged. Beautiful. Okay, if anybody has any questions now's the, about the table, now's the time to, to ask. Um, I don't have any um, table okay. questions, but let me ask you a couple other questions while yes. we're here. And, uh, and then maybe some table questions will come in um, or other dining room questions. So um, one of the questions is about on the ceiling, there are the these wooden, um, uh, sections wouldn't um, in, in the dining room here in the dining room yeah yes. above the uh, the um, lamp and then also around the border yes are those structural no those are pure structural? those are purely decorative um, and when I get back to screen sharing if if there there's a nice picture by the way of that light fixture the suspended light fixture with the art glass this is the end of it the uh, the the flat plate right at the top of the light fixture is the same shape as the dining table if, if the leaves were in it. So, um, you know, these shapes are repeated over and over again. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, I see a question here. Uh, with all the leaves in the table, are there additional supports for the leaves? No, that mechanism that you saw sliding that Michelle was, um, that Jennifer Michelle was pulling out is, is sufficient to support the table. Um, it's remarkably stable when it's at its full extension. What is the height of the ceiling? Oh boy, um, you know, I knew that at one time. It's like nine foot six. So it's quite, quite high, it's up there. The second floor is a couple of inches lower. All right, I'm going to end this. So I think we need to get out of showcase so I can screen share again. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And then we do have a few more questions coming in. All so right. Let me. Might be a good time once you're settled. There we go. We're back again. Yes. Okay. Now this one, um, it came from the time we were in the previous room looking at the um, bookcase. Yes. Um, I would love to hear more about the square pegs, the strapping and the brackets above the wall panels as architectural features and whether they are functional as well. Um, the, all through the house, it is very hard to tell 
um, at first glance what is functional and what is not. The, the whole point of the way the, 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 uh, the, the architects design the house is to blur the lines between functionality and decoration. So um, as, as you see here, the, those little vertical pieces that are between the, uh, the door header and the trim around the top of the wall, those are strictly decorative. In some places, um, pieces like that would be hiding joints, particularly if there's wood behind it. Um, so I, I, you know, it's, it's a combination thereof. Um, we'd have to take a look at a specific location and I might be able to answer it a little clearer, but um, it is, I'm gonna change this to full screen, sorry. There we go. Um, so it's a combination thereof. Now, did you have another one there? Uh, yes, how long did the construction process take, including the furnishings? And um, do we know what the cost was at the time it was built? Yes. <laughs> do you know? <laughs> I do know that. Um, how about we finish the tour? You can watch and take a look at the, uh, the finishes and the design in the house. Let that sink in. And at the very end of the tour, we'll talk about how long it took um, uh, and how much it costs. So think about what you might suggest uh, on the length of time for construction. Okay. Um, does humidity affect any of the furniture and how is the humidity controlled? The humidity is controlled by the Southern California climate. Um, there is no humidity control in the house. Um, so in, in the winter, obviously it's uh, damper than the summer. That table, the, the, where you, the only place I notice it in the house is the center where the two halves of the table come together. Notice there's kind of a breadboard edge on the table. Now that breadboard edge floats. It's not screwed or glued to the tabletop. So if it were, the thing would probably pull itself apart as it expanded and contracted. So the breadboard edge um, where, where the two halves meet, in the wintertime, they touch. In the summertime, there's about a quarter of an inch gap there. So the wood expands and contracts. None of the wood in the house is sealed. It's, it has not been shellacked or varnished or varathaned. It is simply um, linseed oil, tongue oil, and some, sometimes stain. So it allows the wood to breathe, expand and contract without, um, of course, you know, uh, sealing one side of say the tabletop would be disaster because it prevents it from expanding. The bottom side would try to expand and the thing would wind up looking like a potato chip. So, um, uh, you know, that's why the wood in the house, by the way, all the, the wood in the house is untouched. It has never ever been refinished. This, the finishes you're looking at are 112 years old. So they're just beautifully preserved. I hope that answers the question. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to move around. We need to keep moving probably here. Okay. Um, to the left of the picture are a set of double doors that open out onto the rear terrace. So the, uh, in the summertime, these doors can be open and it's almost like sitting outside for having, having your dinner. Um, the Gambles took all of their meals in the dining room. They would, back in the day, there was no such thing as eating in the kitchen. The kitchen was a staff area and the Gambles almost never went in there. Speaking of the kitchen, the door at the, you see the stairs leading to the second floor. That's access between the kitchen, the staff area and the staff quarters above the kitchen. There's a door right, uh, an open door just to the right of those stairs. Under normal circumstances, that door would be closed when the family was here separating the living space from the Gamble's living space from the service areas. Now, I showed you that art glass window at the far end of the room with that beautiful gold, golden glow. Um, the light fixture in the center also has that glow. That's because they're both lit from behind. The, the window is lit by the sun, the light fixture by the light bulbs inside. The glass used there is an iridescent glass. And it's the same in the window, the light fixture. And if you look at that door that's open to the right of the stairs, you can see the iridescence in the window at the top of the door. So if you, we turned off that light fixture, it would have that iridescent finish like the door does. At night, that, that art glass window with the trailing rose pattern would have that iridescent glow. 
So it's a completely different feel in the room at night than it is during the day. The, um, the stairs you're looking at is someplace we never ever take our guests. We go to the base of the stairs and turn right into the kitchen, but those stairs lead to what used to be the staff's quarters. There are two bedrooms and a shared bath up there. And they're currently occupied by two architectural students from the University of Southern California. Every year, they, they, we have a scholars in residence program and every year, two students are selected to live in the house for a year. Hopefully it provides inspiration for them living in this kind of environment. But more importantly to us, it provides great security because there's no better security than having somebody living in the house. So they coordinate their schedules. So one of the two of them is always here at night. During the day, we have staff here and, and docents. But at night, it's nice to have somebody living in the house. But because they're college students, we never go up there. You know, give them, give them their space and maybe we don't want to know what goes on. <laughs> so I'm going to the base of the stairs and to the right into the kitchen. And the kitchen is separated from the dining room by this beautiful butler's pantry. All the wood you see here is maple. Uh, the cabinets, most of the countertops, it's all maple. Um, so the butler's pantry um, is where all the flatware would have been stored. The, um, the, you can barely see into the door into the dining room with the art glass window, um, just a little sliver of that access. So there's a door between the butler's pantry and the dining room. The door we're standing in can be closed and the little roll down shutter off to the far left can be closed, which effectively isolates the, um, the kitchen. Um, so noises and smells from food preparation aren't going to permeate into the dining room. The little, little roll up door can be lifted and plated food handed through, closed again, and then it can be served into the dining room. The, all the, the doors on the cabinets in front of us um, are sliding doors rather than swinging doors. It's a, a smaller space. And so swinging doors, of course, would, would encroach into that space. Also in Southern California, we have these things called earthquakes. And um, with the sliding doors, if we have a really good shaker, um, none of that stuff comes cascading out onto the floor. By the way, this house has survived earthquakes since 1908 with almost no damage at all. So as I rotate around in the kitchen, notice this, the amount of space dedicated to the staff. The, uh, the owners really were generous with their staff members. The counter in front of us, the cabinets are all maple, but the countertops are sugar pine. Sugar pine, of course, being a much softer wood is going to make a little less noise when shuffling plates and cups and glasses. Um, so a lot of consideration was, was made to uh, eliminating um, things that might irritate the family. Um, and so the quieter countertops were part of that. Directly beyond that countertop is a sink. There are a couple of sinks in here. The one in front of us is the food prep sink. And then beyond that are a couple of operable windows to the exterior. Again, part of, remember I talked about ventilation. So ventilation is a really important part of the design of the kitchen. The open doorway leads to a glassed in porch, which is the, basically the staff's dining room. There's also a service entrance back there and stairs down to the full basement. Then the window between the stove and the dining room is also operable. So there's a cross ventilation there. The stove is a 1909, circa 1909 gas stove. It's not the original to the house. It is, is, is an original stove, but not to the Gamble house. The original stove to the Gamble house was probably wood burning or coal burning, which would account for that huge hood overhead. The hood is a steel frame covered with, with a, a wire lath and plaster and then given a couple of coats of enamel. It's cantilevered from the back wall and then there, there are flues inside the, the hood that exhaust um, fumes out and up through the attic to the outside. The door just to the left of the stove leads to the cold room. Now the room itself isn't cold, but there was an ice box in there, a very large ice box. And uh, of course there was no electric refrigerator at the time. 
So the ice man would come to the back door over there by the staff's dining room, come in the back door with a big block of ice and set it into the ice box. Inside there also, there are cabinets very similar to what you see here in the kitchen, but they have stone or marble countertops for doing uh, pastries and confectionaries. The, um, the cabinet to the left of the door is all maple, as is everything else in this picture, with the exception of the very long countertop at the far left of the picture. That is one solid piece, one slab of uh, uh, sugar pine. The length and the width, there are no seams in it. It's one gigantic board. The, the uh, island in the center is all maple, even the top here. Now, this, is con this was intended to be a butcher block. And so there are indeed cleaver marks in the top of it. Um, who knew at the time when somebody was whacking away at, a, at a, a chunk of meat on the tabletop that it would someday be so valuable that we're not allowed to touch it without gloves on. Um, there are drawers on both sides of it. However, those drawers on the ones on the right side are the same as the ones on the left side. In other words, the drawers go all the way through and they can be pulled out from either side. No excuse that I can't find a spatula for dinner. Robert, we've had a couple of questions come in re related yes. specifically to this scene. Uh, the cabinetry being maple, is it stained to look like uh, the mahogany? It, 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 I don't, I, it might be stained very light. Now, I say light because in the next room we're going to, the, the maple furniture was stained darker at one time. Not originally, but it, later on it was stained darker. So if this has a stain on it, it's very light. Keep in mind, what you're looking at is 112 years old. And so it's not like freshly sawn maple that's you know beautiful blonde color. Um, right. This has been given um, uh, coats of um, uh, linseed and tongue oil over the years. Um, nothing since, since we got it from the family, since 1966. Very fine. And then uh, we have a question. What is the construction of the floor? The floor, that's a really good question. I almost forgot about the floor. It's pretty spectacular. Um, over the years, uh, the original floor was a linoleum floor. Linoleum was state of the art at the time in 1908. Um, and um, of course, over the years it wore, and so it was replaced. And then ultimately in 1966, um, they were going to replace it again. The then curator uh, or director of the house decided to replace the, the linoleum one more time. When they tore it up, the subfloor under here is all beautiful, solid maple. Um, it's not, you know, um, scrap wood, it is solid maple. So they decided at the time to not put the, the, the um, linoleum down, but to refinish the maple. Well, it looked beautiful, but that was misleading for years and years and years. So our current director, um, Ted Bosley, who's been director for almost 30 years now, um, has always wanted to return the floor to its original condition. So this is um, a reinstallation of the original uh, linoleum floor. The company is still in business. Um, the patterns and the colors are still available, um, but they rather than do it in sheets like they did back in the day, each of those squares is an individual little square. And, um, you know, it takes, the company donated the material and the installer donated his time. Oh my goodness, it's, it's generosity like this that helps make this house possible. Anything else there? Um, one question that goes back to the college students. Yes. Um, I'm assuming they don't use this kitchen. Do they have eating facilities? Yeah. <laughs> good, yeah, it's a good question. At one time they did. Um, that, that stove wasn't there. There was a, a 1930 gas magic chef there for, for years. And they did at one time use this kitchen. Um, finally, we came to our senses and booted them out. Um, as I said, there's a full basement. The basement is used in, is a, a place where we, um, we, we entertain down there. And there's a, there's a um, small industrial kitchen downstairs. Keep in mind, they're college students. So if the food is not microwavable, it's probably not edible. Um, so that's, yeah, I, I shouldn't say that. They do cook downstairs in the basement. Yes. And then on the ceiling over on the left-hand side, ah, is that a door to something? The, the, the panel on the ceiling is part of the ventilation system. I'm glad somebody asked about it. Um, it, you know, hot air rises. And so 
during the, the food preparation process, uh, heat generated from the stove and exhaust from the, the, the food prep can, can rise up out. Of, it's, it's, it's gravity feed, so the hot air rises. It goes up out through the second floor and, and through the attic to the outside. Now, the, the walls are, are tiled with uh, what we today call subway tile. It's not just on the exposed portions of the wall, but if you look at the cabinets to the left, it's behind the glass front cabinets. It actually continues all the way down behind the lower cabinets and the tall cabinet in the center of the picture, all the way down to the floor. Uh, keep in mind, this is all has to do with the, the architect's father being a physician. They understood the importance of, of good hygiene. And so uh, no, no mouse is gonna gnaw his way through that wall. All right, I'm going to work our way out of the kitchen. We're going back into the entry hall. Excuse the circuitous route here. Now, we do this with our tours. They have to have retraced their steps back out in the entry hall and you'll see where we are again. There's the front doors. And I told you that to the right of the front door is the only bedroom on the first floor. So that is where we're headed. Now we consider this a, um, a non-family guest room. And I say, let me go the other way, I'm sorry. Um, we say non-family because there's another guest room directly above this on the second floor. And, and we pretty much consider that as a family guest room. So um, this, this room, um, the furniture in here is all maple. The flooring now running parallel with the walls because it's a bedroom um, is, is uh, the quarter sawn white oak and the trim on the walls, the door, the door frames and the window frames is all Port Orford cedar. Port comes from Port or in and around Port Orford, Oregon. If you haven't worked with Port Orford cedar, it's a beautiful wood to work with. It's very, very tight, straight grain, has a wonderful smell when you're working it. So uh, this, this is not the color of the Port Orford cedar though. It's been given kind of a gray wash. So it's in keeping with some of the silver accents you'll see in the room. The door that's open obviously leads to one of the bathrooms. Um, and uh, the bathrooms are the only place in the house that the wood was painted. Of course, there's white tile on the floor. There are white fixtures. The walls are painted white and all the woodwork is painted white. They were given seven coats of white enamel originally, hand rubbed between each coat. Somehow they managed not to paint the little oak pegs that hold all that together. To the left of the door, you'll see the two sconces. I'll show you a close up detail of those sconces in, in just a minute. But the writing desk, or excuse me, the makeup, makeup table here is all maple. Uh, much of it is bird's eye maple. It is inlaid with uh, silver ribbon, vermilion wood, and ebony. And again, I'll show you a really close up shot of that. It is absolutely spectacular. Now this furniture I, I mentioned had been stained darker. It, it, it's maple, but it had been stained for some reason, the family stained it all dark at one point. And this is the only furniture in the house that has had any work done to it. The stain was, was stripped off of it after the 1966 gift to the public. Um, but the sconces up above, when you see a close up, you'll see how the, the sconces are darker. They have not been stained. As we rotate around, you see the large door that opens uh, from a vestibule between here and the entry hall. Behind that open door is a pocket slider, slides into the wall. There's a very large walk-in closet. It has built-in chest of drawers, uh, clothes hanging rods, hooks, plenty of room for a steamer trunk, and yet it's big enough to use, be used as a dressing room. It even has a, a, an intercom in there. Every room in the house has an intercom. So if you need assistance, you can, you can contact the staff to come in and, uh, and help you out. The beds, as I rotate around, um, were designed by the architects and crafted specifically for this room. They're brass beds, but they've been nickel silver plated and they have etched into both sides of the footboard and the headboard trailing rose pattern. To all you know, the rose, rose pattern is, is prevalent throughout the house. As I rotate around, you can see the writing desk. 
Um, I'll show you some close-ups of that, but let me show you the sconce here. Um, these are Alex Vertikoff photographs. They're absolutely spectacular. Um, the, the wood on the sconce is maple. And again, this was stained darker. So it doesn't look like the maple that you expect to see. Uh, the art glass crafted by Emil Lang. And then it's a, um, a dogwood pattern, the, the flower pattern. And notice rather than leather straps, this is hung by silver straps. Um, and then there's also the inlay at the very bottom of the, the, uh, the vertical piece that holds the, the lantern. And as I rotate around this writing desk, which by the way, has traveled all over the world. Um, years and years ago, I was at the uh, uh, Victoria and Albert Museum in London and there was an arts and crafts exhibit. And I walked in and wow, there's the Gamble House writing desk. So take a look at this. Oh my goodness. Uh, I don't know what to say. I, I should probably just stop talking and let you look at it. The, um, the trailing rose pattern, you can see the silver inlay. It's actually silver ribbon stood on end, and it's not a uniform thickness. It has been hammered thinner in places and thicker in other places. The, the roses are vermilion wood, and then their little black ebony um, pieces is part of that vine. You can see the contrasting wood square pegs that cover the screws that hold the, the, the chair rail um, to, the, to the vertical pieces. Um, the letter box has little bell-shaped silver handles on it. And you know, I hate it when you drop the silver handle and it dents the wood. So right in the center of the silver handle, there's a little peg that stands proud of the surface to prevent the handle from hitting the surface. By the way, all of this inlay does stand proud of the surface. It's not, not flush with the surface. And you can see there's inlay even on the legs of the, uh, the, the, right, the letter box. Mm -hmm. Is there any need to, um, to clean the silver inlay? Does it tarnish? Um, you know, it does, but all it requires is a little bit of rubbing from, um, the last thing we want is to uh, have the black from the silver uh, bleed into the maple. So it's almost no maintenance at all. Um, I have never seen, I've been involved in the house for, for 35 years, and I've never seen anybody clean it. I've never seen anybody polish those silver handles. So um, that's a good question. Uh, maybe Jennifer Michelle knows, but uh, and I've never seen anybody touch it. Mm, okay. And then um, about the windows, there was a question. Are yes. they casement windows, and do they swing in or out? These, these are, yeah, these swing in and out. They're not casement wing windows. They, they, they swing in and out and they, they swing in and they're screened. So they could be opened and, and not gonna allow bugs. Not that we have bugs in Pasadena, but um, you know, they uh, allow for ventilation. And there were typically two sets of curtains on all the windows. What you're looking at are the shears. Um, they, they could be closed during the, the day to let you know, give some privacy yet still let the light in. And on either side of those, you see the heavier curtains hanging. They're separate curtain rods. And so those heavier curtains could be drawn at night for privacy. All right, let me rotate around and we're going to exit. I hope you're not getting seasick here. We're going to exit the first floor back out into the entry hall and we're going up those stairs. But rather than navigate the stairs, I'm going to take the transporter to the second floor, just like that. Robert, you're doing a marvelous job on this tour. I love this 3D photo capability you've embraced. It, it, it takes a little practice. See all those little circles on the ground. You can stand in any one of those places. And so, you know, I've done this enough. I, you know, I have my favorite places to stand. Thank you very much. Um, this upstairs hall is directly above the first floor hall. And in front of us is a wide screen door that leads out onto one of the three sleeping porches. It can be open for ventilation. And behind us, when I turn around, you'll see that there's a, a, a whole bank of windows that all the windows swing in and are screened for, for ventilation. The door to the right is the David Mary Gamble's bedroom. We'll go into there in a, in a few minutes. 
Um, the door to the left that's open leads up to the attic. We'll also go there before we're done. And then, um, and now here you can see, just barely see that the flooring is running parallel with the walls rather than diagonal. So as I rotate around, you'll see built-in casework. Now this is not linen closet, this is just storage. These are mahogany cabinets um, with a couple of nice Weller bowls above. But most of the wood on the second floor, the door frames, the doors, um, the uh, window frames are all Port Orford cedar. And, and the beam, big beam you see overhead is, is a, it's cased. It's a, a Douglas fir beam and it's got a Port Orford cedar case over it. The handles that you see on the storage cabinets are really neat. Um, they're pinned at the bottom. You can see a peg barely at the bottom of the handle. So it swivels on that peg. And if you push the handle to one side, the latch opens and the door swings open. Um, the the uh, strike of that latch mechanism is not bronze or brass or any other metal. It's their ebony. And it just shows how hard the ebony is because after 112 years, there's hardly a mark on those ebony strikes. So as I rotate around, you'll see another door that's closed here. This leads to the staff's quarters. This is where the students live. This door is always closed. Um, we never, ever bother the students. Um, you know, they're trying to live in the house with uh, 150 docents marching through. So we give them their privacy. And you can see the stickly furniture that's in the upstairs hall, uh, the stickly mirror hanging from the picture rail. And as I just to the just beyond that settee is is a guest room. We'll go into that in just a minute. And then you can see the bank of windows. They all swing in. They're all screened, provide ventilation and the bench seat in front of the windows again lifts up, provides for storage underneath. Even the armrests lift up and provide for storage. And then there are bookcases on either side of that. So we rotate around, you can see the upper portion of that first floor staircase. Um, the window that you see off to the left, the small window opens into David Mary Gamble's bedroom. The window's operable, as you can see, and pro provides for cross ventilation into their bedroom. The, um, we're going to go into the open door that's at the far end of the staircase into what we, we affectionately refer to as the boys' bedroom. It actually was the bedroom of Clarence. Clarence was the youngest of their three boys. And uh, Clarence was 14 at the time that this house was built. Uh, the eldest son was already married and established his own career. Um, the middle son was, I believe, away in college. And Clarence at 14, was out here in Pasadena going to school, boarding school. His parents were still in Cincinnati while the house was being built. And Clarence at 14 was the liaison between the family and the architects. Um, I can't believe a 14 year old kid was given the responsibility of, of purchasing mattresses and communicating with the architect and, and, and uh, uh, architect's clients. Um, I, you know, the 14 year old kid next door to me well, we won't go there. Um, so as we want to go around now, every, all the wood in here, with the exception of the floor, is again Port Orford cedar. To the right of the bed is a glass door that leads out onto a sleeping porch. There are three of these, one off the boy's bedroom, one off David Mary Gamble's bedroom, and one off Aunt Julia's bedroom. Um, they were extensions of the living space blurred the lines between interior and exterior. They were actually furnished and they had cots out there. And so um, in the summertime, family would sleep out on their sleeping porches. They were never screened in, they never glassed in, they were wide open. And compared to the Ohio Valley, we don't have bugs. Um, to the left of the bed is a door that's part way open and uh, it's a private bath for Clarence's bedroom. Um, there's a tub, shower, wash basin, the shower is solid marble uh, slabs, and it was the only shower in the house at the time. Robert, we've accumulated a couple of questions yeah, here. Yeah, sure, of course. One, someone wanted to know if that was a Stickley Morris chair there in the corner. It's 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 a Stickley chair. Um, it's a rocker, and wow. and the Morris there is a Morris chair. We'll see that when we go downstairs into Mr. Gamble's den. But the, this is all Stickley. Now that's a really good question because. Um, 
there may have been furniture designed for this room and the next one we're going to see. If it was, it was never built. And so uh, stickly furniture was always used in these rooms. What you see here is a combination of uh, pieces owned by the Gamble House and some pieces that are on kind of long-term loan from a collector. Okay. That's a good question. We've also had some questions about what what uh, what is the the space the size of the spaces we've been looking at. Uh, the one question came up while we were outside this bedroom in that hallway. Um, well, I can tell you the house it is. If you, you've kind of been able to figure, they're not all that many rooms, but the house is eight thousand square feet, <laughs> so it's huge. Uh, the rooms are enormous. Um, the the linen closet or linen room is about the size of my bedroom at home. So these are really big spaces. Um, but the way if you look at it, it's, it's a little hard to figure out where say in this room to put a bed because there's so many windows and doors, um, plus the fireplace. So, um, and of course, back in the day, these single beds were what's available, you know, they didn't have king size and queen size beds like they do today. The cabinets, um, that you're looking at there are all wardrobe cabinets, wardrobe closets. Every closet in the house is vented into the attic space for, again, air circulation. Um, down below the closet doors are drawers, shoe drawers, to keep your shoes separated from your clothes. That's a, an idea that I guess not didn't catch on. The swords above the fireplace are um, not original to the house, but the pegs are. Uh, the pegs used to hold a samurai sword and scabbard that was purchased in the Orient by one of the boys. Uh, these are Civil War era swords, one from the Gamble family and one from the Green family. Um, I'm not going to get into which one is which or which one's better than the other. <laughs> Too many arguments there. Um, the fireplace is constructed of pressed brick, very, very dense brick, not like the red brick that you'd use on the exterior of the house. This is like fire brick. Um, however, all of the edges of the brick have been hand sanded. So you can run your hand over the brick and it's smooth. Um, the grout lines, notice in order to emphasize the horizontal line, the horizontal grout lines are much wider than the vertical grout lines. And there's a solid marble piece above the, the, uh, the fireplace. And then inlaid into the plaster above are these geometric shapes. Um, I, I'm not sure quite what they're supposed to represent, but when you get in, when we get into the master bedroom, you'll see them again. And then the door to the left of the fireplace is a small walk-in wardrobe closet. Notice the joinery above that closet door, the uh, finger lap joints, um, or open mortise and tendon, maybe it's called, but finger lap anyway. <laughs> and the, the wall sconces in here are, the shades are white, commercial shades. Um, they're in most of the bedrooms up on the second floor here. We'll move straight across the hall to the family guest room. Come on, you can do it. Uh, maybe, there we go. Just to, just to note, the, yes. um, the size of that room is 14.5 feet by 20 foot and the ceiling height <coughs> Um, I don't see what the ceiling height is, but. Oh, I've got it somewhere here. Um, Jennifer um, has put that in there. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. The ceiling is eight foot eight. Eight foot eight, okay. According to Jennifer, not me. <laughs> eight, eight foot eight. And so the, the ceiling on the first floor is, is just a couple of inches taller. So it's closer to nine feet on the first floor. Now this is a, a, a guest room as well. Now in 19... 15 or 16, the house was beautifully photographed um, with every room that had green and green furniture in it. The two rooms that did not have green and green furniture, this one and the boy's bedroom that we were just in, were never photographed. So we have no clue what the furniture arrangement may have been in this room. Uh, but given its size, it sort of stands to reason that it was not just a bedroom, but also a sitting room. So what you see here again is stickly furniture and because it's a guest bedroom, it has neither a dedicated bath or a sleeping porch. So the, the guests in here did have this nice closet door that would open and, and exposes a, a wash basin, a medicine cabinet with a mirror and a little light fixture. So at least you could do a little damage control before you ran down the hall 
to use the divided bath outside of Aunt Julia's bedroom. We'll see that in a minute. Then again, all of the, the uh, built-in um, um, wardrobe closets. Now you notice each end of the room, let me go back to the other side, on the very left side and the very right side, the ceiling is um, at an angle and it's paneled in wood. The architects, there's a gabled roof above this portion of the house and the architects wanted to bring that gable down lower for better aesthetics, better proportions. In order to do that, the gable roof actually pro projected into the room. So where those, where that gabled, angled gabled roof projects, it's all paneled with Port Orford cedar on each side. Very clever way of, of accommodating the lower roof line on the outside. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to go out into the entry hall, the up, excuse me, the upstairs hall. And we'll head all the way down past these cabinets to David Mary Gamble's bedroom. And I'll find a good place to stand here. Typically, if I stand with the windows behind me, it, it lights the room up nicely. So as I work, work my way around the room, now this is the only room in the house that the furniture is made of black walnut. Now, all the furniture in here was crafted by um, the Hall brothers, designed by Charles and Henry Green. Um, so all of this is black walnut. It has beautiful inlay on just about every piece of furniture. I'll show you a close-up shot of that inlay in a minute. There's a nice floor lamp, a Tiffany floor lamp in the corner, and a built-in telephone stand, and the little square pad right in the corner is actually an intercom system with little buttons so you can communicate with different rooms in the house. The desk, the, the drop front desk is, uh, is all black walnut. You notice there's a vase on top. It's a Rookwood vase, Rookwood from Cincinnati. It has a dogwood pattern. And we actually have communication from Mary Gamble to the architects asking that the dogwood pattern be incorporated into the writing desk. So you can see the two um, little compartments, the doors on the compartments have uh, a dogwood pattern inlaid into them um, using different kinds of hardwood. That nice Tiffany writing set on the, on the desk as well. Then the door adjacent to the desk leads out to the Gambles, David Mary Gamble's private sleeping porch. As we move around, there's a chiffonier um, and on the far side with a chiffonier with a mirror and on the far side of that is a door, it's a little hard to see, that opens into their bathroom space. The fireplace at the far end of the room is uh, similar to all the fireplaces in the house. They all were gas. They, it, this one has those ceramic briquettes um, as well. And the andirons that you see, remember the stone inlay above the fireplace in the boys' bedroom, that kind of geometric shape? That is turned vertically on those andirons at the fireplace. And it is also in the light fixture above us. I'll show you that in just a second. But you can see the beds um, with the inlay at the, at the foot, uh, footboard and headboard of the beds. It's again, it's a, a floral pattern. And um, the, you can see the chair right in front of us has a, a, a void in it with the ebony perimeter. Um, that is the same shape as the dining table. And it's derived from a design of a tsuba, T-S-U-B-A. The tsuba was a handguard on a Japanese samurai sword. And so not the only shape, but a very common shape. And it was used all throughout the house. Let me show you the light fixture here. Oh, what can I say? It is uh, Port Orford cedar, the finger lap joinery. It's inlay. There again is that, 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 uh, geometric shape that you saw above the fireplace in the boys' bedroom. It's tur turned vertically. And then they're very st stylized roses. Now, this is all inlay with abalone shell. The lanterns uh, are hung with leather straps. Um, there's a glass, mirrored glass reflector down inside to project all the light up to bounce it off the ceiling. And as I rotate around, for a couple questions. Yes, go ahead. 
upgraded HVAC in the ceiling. Is that what we see? Um, in two rooms, you spotted that. You were not supposed to look at it. Ignore <laughs> the man behind the curtain. Um, the, the house never had air conditioning, but um, sometime after it opened to the public in 1966, the two bedrooms, the boys' bedroom and the upstairs guest room, were used as offices. Um, actually, the AIA was in one of those offices for a while, the California, uh, Pasadena chapter. Um, and so air conditioning was put in. Uh, those are the only two rooms in the house that have air conditioning. I should say three rooms, the attic also does, and I'll explain that in a minute. Mm -hmm. So none of the rooms ever had air conditioning until um, sometime after 1966, and only those two rooms do. Okay. Yeah. And the, are the views from the house as amazing as the interiors? Yes, and I'll, in just a minute, we're going to go out on one of the sleeping porches and you can see. Okay, okay. Yeah. And the wall colors, are they original? To Good question. Original? That's a great question. Um, if you look at the color of the wall, yes, to answer your question, they are as close to original as we can get. Um, below the picture rail, that where the door header is, is a darker color. Above that, the wall turns lighter. And then the ceiling is yet a third color. It's even lighter still. So there's this, this graduation of three colors. Just about every room in the house is like that. Sometimes it's very subtle. Uh, it's hard to notice. So most, most guests probably wouldn't notice unless they were told. All right, take a look at this. This is the kind of inlay that you see on all of the furniture. The black ebony shape is the shape of the dining table with no leaves in it. And that's that tsuba shape that you saw on, the, on all of the furniture in here. And then there's a floral pattern. And that floral pattern is the branches are, are created with um, inlaid lignum vitae. Lignum vitae is very, very hard wood um, and polishes up beautifully. And then the, the, the blue and green colors are semi-precious stones that are inlaid into the wood. And again, it's on, on every piece of furniture. On the backs of the chairs, those suba shapes are voids. In other words, there's no wood in the center of it. And then the little dots around the, 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 the ebony are uh, little brass brads that help hold it together. And the, the, the background wood is all black walnut. All right, I'm going to move out of this room back into the upstairs hall. Now the door right in front of us is um, a door to the attic. The two steps up and then up, up into the attic, this big open stairwell. Um, the door on the right side leads out, leads out to one of the, the three sleeping porches, which we'll go to in just a second. So I'm going to move over into this little vestibule. A lot going on in this vestibule. As I rotate around, you see all that's going on here. Um, the door to the far left leads into <coughs> the linen closet. It's about the size of my bedroom. Um, it's all cedar lined, um, not, not the aromatic cedar that you're used to in like a, a, a cedar trunk, but it's Port Orford cedar and it's certainly uh, insect resistant. Um, it has ventilation, not only in the ceiling up into the attic space, but it has windows that open into the bathroom that you see on one side and the open stairwell on the other side. So the linen closet or linen room has cross ventilation as well. The open door obviously leads to one half of a divided bath. The door to that, that room where the bathtub is, is identical to the art glass door you see just to the right of it. Um, again, the shape that is at the top of the art glass door is the shape of the dining table, and it is like it echoes as it comes down the door. And so those art glass doors uh, allow light into the bathrooms. The, the side that's open obviously has a tub and it has a wash basin. The side that's closed has the water closet. So this would be used not only by Aunt Julia, whose room we're going to go into in a second, it would be used by the guests staying in that upstairs guest room. So they, they could, you know, it's a divided bath, so two people could be using uh, facilities here. As we rotate around into Aunt Julia's bedroom, 
I'm going to find a better spot to stand. Now, Aunt Julia was Mary Gamble's younger sister. She never married. And when David Mary Gamble decided to build the house in Southern California, they asked Aunt Julia, Julia Huggins was her name. Um, they asked her if she would like to be accommodated. And um, I think her exact words were, duh, uh, you know, why not come to Southern California? You know, Aunt Julia, Look, look at the furniture, still designed by the same architects, crafted by the Hall brothers, or at least commissioned um, by them. Um, it's, it's willow and ash is used in here. Ash being the hard surfaces of the writing desk, the makeup table, and the little table in front of us. Um, and willow or rattan for the chairs. The bed was a commercial brass bed, but it was at the time nickel silver plated so that it was more in keeping with the rest of the furnishings in the house. There's really no exposed brass anywhere in the house. Wardrobe closets behind the bed there. One of those four doors opens up and there's a full length mirror on the inside. And again, they're all vented to the attic space. As we move around, you'll see a firewall, tile wall here. I guess Aunt Julia wasn't completely convinced that the, the newfangled heating system was going to work. Um, or, or maybe she wasn't convinced that the weather in Southern California was glorious. So she wanted accommodation for her Franklin stove. Um, but apparently, so rather than the fireplace, she got the firewall. So apparently when she moved out here, the, the weather was glorious and the heat worked and she never sent for the Franklin stove. So she put a, a, a plug over the, the, where the flu would go and lived with that for the rest of her life. As we move around, you'll see a drop front desk, another drop front desk. Now, almost like the one in David Mary Gamble's bedroom. Now this desk, as I said, the, the, the writing surface tilts up flush with the vertically, flush, flush with the front of the desk. And the support that's underneath that writing surface automatically retracts as you lift the, the desktop up. There's a cam mechanism inside, very, very cool mechanism. Um, so that's, that's, again, that's all ash. Um, nice little Tiffany lamp on top of it. The double doors lead out, out to Aunt Julia's sleeping porch. So we're going to go out there. Now, this has no furniture on it now, but it was a, a, an extension of the living space. When I first started at the house, it had wicker tables and chairs out here. Um, but after 112 years, they're just too delicate. They're in storage, but um, we can't take the risk of somebody sitting on them. So the, there are a series of doors in front of us. The double doors right in the middle are those double doors that lead out of Aunt Julia's bedroom. The door to the right of that is just a small broom closet. And the door to the left of that opens into the upstairs, main upstairs hall. Now, Aunt Julia entertained out here quite a bit, but it would have been very inappropriate at the time for guests to walk through Aunt Julia's bedroom to get out onto the sleeping porch. So they had access from the upstairs hall to, um, to access the, uh, the, the sleeping porch. As we rotate around, somebody asked about the view. Now, this is the view from the back, from that sleeping porch. The trees at the time probably were non-existent. These are all oak trees, they're volunteers. And just in the time I've been involved in the house, they've doubled in size. But that in the distance that would have looked out over the Arroyo, Arroyo Seco. It's a, a, a canyon off in the distance. And then on the other side are some, some mountain ranges that, that are covered with homes now. Of course, at the time, none of that was there. It was, you were looking out onto the wilderness. That serpentine wall below us is made of clinker bricks. Clinkers are rejects. They're bricks that got too close to the heat source in the firing process and were misshapen and discolored and typically thrown away. But the architects, Charles and Henry, um, loved the colors and the textures and incorporated them into these serpentine walls and, and, and used big round river stones that were hauled out of the arroyo in the distance. So it's a style that was perfected by the greens and then very unsuccessfully copied all over Pasadena by other architects. And you can see the property here. It's on its original property. It's about uh, 2.7 acres um, of land. 
there were six homes on Westmoreland Place. This was the largest parcel, and the only one that actually has a garage as well. So you can see the garage off in the distance, and behind the garage, there's a nice cutting garden. We'll wind up down there before we're done. And this is also a good place to see the rafter tails and extended eaves and rafter tails. Now notice the, the downspouts into a collection box down the face of the building through a beam and then goes underground, takes the water away from the house. It doesn't even run across the terrace, takes the water underground away, probably dumps into the neighbor's yard. I don't know. Um, so, you know, this would have been a lovely place to, to spend time. So there were, as I said, three of these sleeping porches and you can see the one off David Mary Gamble's bedroom right in front of us. As I rotate around, you'll see the door back into the entry hall. So we're going to pretend we went through that door and go up the stairs to the attic. And let me rotate around, find a better spot here. Now this looks pretty nice for an attic, doesn't it? This room probably gets used more than any room in the house, uh, with the exception of the furniture and the flooring, the carpet. It is, it is all original, it's untouched. It hasn't been refinished. Um, the wood on the walls is, uh, is mostly Port Orford cedar. However, the, the rafters, um, the, the, uh, the trusses overhead are all Douglas fir. Now these trusses, remember down in the living room, we said uh, there was a queen post truss, had two vertical posts. This has a single vertical post in the center. This is a king post truss. And you can see the mortise and tenon, the, the uh, tenon sticking down through the bottom of the, the bottom cord of the truss. And then it's pegged with wooden pegs on, on either side. Uh, at the ends of the truss, um, there are corbels that are strapped, metal strapping, um, to help hold it all in place. The, even though this was just an attic, um, and it was used as an attic, it was used for storage, um, it's a very important part of the design and function of the house. I've talked about ventilation all through this, this tour, and at the end of a hot day in, in California, if it's 100 degrees, you can imagine the heat would have built up if it weren't for this third floor. The heat would have built up on the bedroom level below. And, uh, but with this third floor and the open stairwell, uh, all of the vents in the closets, the vents in the kitchen, uh, all through the house allows the hot air to rise up into this third floor. At the, in the afternoon or early evening, the staff can come up here. All of these windows are operable. They all swing in, they're all screened. At the ends of the room, the opposite ends, there are even panels, solid wood panels that open to the outside and open into the enclosed attic spaces. So all of the hot air in the house can be exhausted out. It rises up and exhausts out the top and at the same time pulls the cool evening air in down below. So this is sort of nature's air conditioning. Um, as I said, this room gets used more than any room in the house. It's used for seminars and for lectures. We use it for the docent training. It's a nice place to come for 16 Saturdays out of the year to come spend your morning up here in the attic um, and touring the house. So if any of you are interested in becoming a docent, talk to me. <laughs> come to California. Any questions about the attic before we leave? Well, we have one question semi-related. <clears throat> yes. When, when we were looking out through the uh, sleeping porch, somebody noticed that the rafter tails are looking a bit weathered. They are. Um, yeah. 100, 112 years of being exposed to um, the weather in Southern California. It does rain here. Um, and and um, those rafter tails, some of them have actually been restored. The rafter tails, they, they were deteriorated because of uh, dry rot and sometimes bug infestation. Um, but replacing them was out of the question because the rafter tails are these same rafters you're looking at inside this room. If, if you look, uh, if you follow this rafter, it continues out and you can see the rafter tail right there. So replacing them was out of the question. They were re repaired. Um, the ends of the rafter tails were repaired in some cases by, this was happened 14 years ago, 
by removing some of the damaged wood and replacing it with a, a, an epoxy that had the same properties as the wood. In other words, it expanded and con contracted, it, it got wet and it dried out. So um, it wouldn't separate from the wood. Um, if we used most epoxies, they're hard and water would get trapped between the hard surface and the wood and just hasten the rotting. So even though they were restored um, to the original bulk of the rafter tail, they were then carved into the, into the exposed epoxy, all the, the checks and cracks that were in the, the uh, adjacent rafter tails. So they look not new. The last thing we wanted was them to look like they did 100 years ago. We wanted to look like it's a well-maintained 112-year-old house. I hope that answers the question. Mm -hmm. um, there was another question actually yes. uh, from a while ago, and I was waiting for the right time. Now, before, before you go on, um, are you okay? We're way over time, but asking questions along the way, I think, is wonderful. Okay, okay. Um, how does Ed, is that okay that we continue? Robert, is that okay that we can? Oh, I'm fine. Okay, okay. Yes, please, so, please um, let's continue. I, we've, we've still got uh, 100 people interested in what's going on. All right, terrific. I love it. All Fantastic. right. Fantastic. So, um, you know, the pegs were used throughout the home in so many places. <laughs> yes. Um, they're somewhat emblematic of the Green Brothers. What were their influences? What, um, how did they get some of these ideas? Where did they come from? Well, you may have, have gotten the feeling um, uh, some Asian flavor here. Um, Charles and Henry Green were fascinated by uh, uh, Japanese and Chinese uh, art, design, furniture making. Um, they, they even attended the uh, uh, 1893 exhibition in Chicago and visited the Japanese pavilion. Um, in their, their library after, after their deaths, um, there were lots of publications about Japanese design and art. So I think there was a huge influence um, from both um, Japan and from the outside. A lot of people say that the house looks kind of like a Swiss chalet. Maybe that's just attributed to the long overhanging eaves, but certainly they were very influenced by Japanese art and architecture. Um, and many of the details that you see are, um, can be traced back to, to Asian, Asian designs. Mm -hmm. And um, the, pegs, the pegs throughout the house, some of them are functional, some of them are covering brass screws or fasteners, and others are purely decorative. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's uh, without pulling things apart, it's sort of impossible to tell which ones are which. But there are this, this this king post truss where the, the with the mortise and tenant has wooden pegs that hold it together there are no metal fasteners here you can see the the shapes on the wall over here where my cursor is um, they have uh, tenons that stick into the vertical posts and they're pegged with wooden pegs here as well mm -hmm. okay yeah yeah all right we're going to exit the attic and this is this is the stairs that we would go down, but rather than um, navigate down the stairs, I'm going to use the transporter again and go down to the first floor. This time we're going to the right and into David Gamble's study, David Gamble's den. Now I'm going to turn all the way around. I don't make you all seasick here. Now, David Gamble, at the time that they had this house built, as I said, was retired from Procter and Gamble. But somebody like that just never, I'm sure, fully retires. He still had many business dealings with the with the the, uh, the business community in Pasadena, and. Uh, the Gambles were also dealing with many, many philanthropic activities. So this was David Gamble's, essentially his office in the house. And um, this is the only room in the house that um, uses oak exclusively. Now, all the other rooms had oak floors, but this room, the doors, the, the window frames, the door frames, all of the wall trim, the um, casework is all oak. Um, now the door that's open in front of us is between the oak office and the teak entry hall and is the door naturally is oak on this side and teak on the other side. So I mean, of course, 
they had to split it right down the middle. The fireplace um, is again made of the pressed brick, similar to the brick upstairs in the boys' bedroom. Notice how it flares out at the top to support the hearth of the fireplace directly above in the boys' bedroom. The, um, the floor in here, again, the white oak flooring is in a chevron pattern, and that chevron pattern carries through to the, the brick um, 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 threshold, um, what I want to say, the, uh, the, the front of the fireplace. And again, this would have been a gas burning fireplace. Because this is the smallest room in the house, um, in order to provide some volume to it, there's no drop ceiling in here. You see the exposed rafters that support the second floor and then um, paneling right up against the underside of the second floor here. Somebody asked about the Amoris chair. Well, what you see here is Mr. Gamble's uh, personal Morris chair, not created by Morris. Um, the idea of a Morris chair um, was uh, William Morris created a chair with an adjustable back. And just about every chair after that that had an adjustable back, the angle of the back uh, was called a Morris chair. So I don't know who the manufacturer of this chair is, but there's a, a rod at the, at the back that allows that the angle of that back to be adjusted. The um, Photographs you see are our architects, Charles and Henry Green, Charles on the left, Henry on the right at age 37 and 35 or something like that. A um, little bit about the architects very quickly. Um, they went to a manual arts high school. Now they learned a manual arts school. They learned to work with their hands. They learned to work with wood and metal and, and uh, electric. Um, so as architects, they sort of understood what could be built and what could not be built. Uh, you know, I've worked for a number of architects that would design things that could not be built. Um, so these guys really understood it. As I said before, Charles was more of the, the dreamer um, and maybe came up with some fantastical ideas. And Henry was the one who sat on him and said, no, we can't do that, but we can do this. And so together they really worked well. The door you see there with the, um, the, the glass door um, is a private entrance to David Gamble's study uh, from the outside terrace. So he could have guests come and go without disturbing the occupants of the house. So I'm going to take us outside uh, onto that terrace. And side terrace, there we go. So you can see the front door off in the distance at the far end of the terrace. That's where we walked into the house. So the door right in the center of the image is the door to Mr. Gamble's den. So that's where his private guests would come. This, this terrace that we're standing on um, is directly below the sleeping porch off the boys' bedroom. Um, and it provides a nice area for entertaining. The benches here are, were not original. We put these in. This is where we um, stage guests prior to the tours and give them the orientation. But this space would have been a continuation of the living space. And again, kind of blurred the lines between the interior and exterior of the house. And you can see here, even, even though we're outside, every piece of wood, every structural member, um, the corners are rounded over. Um, it's, it, the joinery is all exposed. There's no way, look, look at the joinery in the corner here. And now this looks like it's right out of Japanese temple design. And, and of course, the, the lanterns look right out of Japanese temple design as well. As we rotate around, you can see Westmoreland Place, the private street out in front, and that beautiful brick driveway, which, by the way, is also a houndstooth pattern. Um, that brick driveway has been down there for 112 years, and the grout is still in wonderful shape. Of course, we don't allow anybody to drive on it anymore. And so it also, it, it tees off and leads to the garage off in the distance. The garage, um, even though it's just a garage, notice it still has the long overhanging eaves and the extended rafter tails. It has the same material vocabulary as the rest of the house. Um, the garage uh, accommodated plenty of room for two cars plus working space. Um, as I said, they, the, um, the owners and the architects embraced the automobile. So there was not only the room for the two cars, they had their own in-house gas pump. They had an underground gasoline tank 
which by the way, the EPA knows about, it's been filled in now. Um, they had um, uh, an in-ground mechanics pit. A mechanics pit, for those of you who don't know, is, is about a six foot deep pit, very narrow. Cars would drive over it, it had steps at one end, so you could climb down into the mechanics pit and work on the underside of the car. That's since been filled in. Uh, hanging from the rafters are some very large hooks that would be maybe used for car maintenance. Um, so that is now the location of our bookstore. So we're next going to go to the garden behind the garage. Before we get too far away from the study, Robert, there's a yes. question. Yes, uh, by all means. Someone wanted to know about that interest, interesting uh, fixture hanging from the ceiling in front of the fireplace. Um, again, it, that was designed to act as indirect lighting. Keep in mind, in 1908, not every house was electrified. Many of the houses in 1908 had uh, backup um, uh, gas lighting because they felt that the, the electric was unknown and, and um, power generating was sporadic maybe. The house, the Gamble house was always fully electrified. So the light, there was concern about the long-term effects of looking at the filament of a light bulb. I mean, it was just unknown. It's sort of like when microwaves uh, came out on the market, people were reluctant to stand in front of them. They thought they might explode or something um, from the microwaves. So they erred on the safe side. So the most of the lighting that the, the architects design is indirect lighting. It shines up and bounces off the ceiling. Those light fixtures in the living room and, and most of the light fixtures are hung again from leather straps. Um, wood framing designed by the halls um, by John Hall and then the art glass by Emil Lang. So I hope that answers the question. Any, any others? Okay, I'm then going to go to the garden. Take a walk out to the garden. Sorry, as you're doing that, what's the roofing material? Oh, really, really good question. I didn't even mention that. Uh, let, me, let me go down here and um, I'll, I'll talk about the roofing. Um, a lot of people expect the house to have shake roof. But as you can see in this image, the angle of the roof is so shallow that if you had a shake roof, capillary action would pull the water up underneath the shakes. So the roofing material originally and today was, is a composite roofing, a sheet roofing, uh, very similar to today's composite sheet roofing with tar and kind of a fine sand on it. Um, the original material was called malthoid. Um, the pr problem there was that it had lots of asbestos in it and, it, and that original sheet roofing failed after 10 or 12 or 15 years and had to be replaced. Over the years, a number of different roofing materials were put on. And then um, 12, 13, 14 years ago, maybe, we, when we did the repair on the rafter tails, we also replaced the roofing material. It was taken down to the original sheathing and, and a, a contemporary type roofing that would look exactly like the original malthoid was used. Um, even right down to the original seams, the direction and, and dimensions of the seams, that's all on the drawings, the original drawings. And so we were able to recreate that roofing. Now, the, you saw downspouts on the house, but there are no gutters. That's because the edges of all of these roof planes turns up at the edge. There's about a four inch lip on the roof and so it collects the water um, and, and directs it toward to drains, to downspouts that go down the face of the building and then away from the building underground. So it's a really good question about the roofing material. Any I others? You answered another question about the downspout, so that was perfect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, this, this is one of my favorite spots on the site. Um, I spend a lot of time out here in the garden. We're all volunteers. So um, the people who give the tours are volunteers. The people who maintain the gardens are volunteers. We've got lots of different committees for hospitality and so forth. We've got a, an active volunteer um, uh, list of about 150 people. Um, many of them have been there like I have for, for decades. And um, you know they're absolutely dedicated and very protective of the Gamble House. Um, this is a great view looking up at the house. This is the north face of the house. 
and off to the left is the garage. You notice some windows. At the back of the garage, there are two day rooms and a shared bathroom for the staff. The gardener um, would have access. Now the gardener didn't live on site, but he's probably spent all day here. So um, the, there were accommodations there for the gardener. And later on after David Gamble um, was deemed un unable to drive an automobile, that wasn't until 1923, um, they, they had a chauffeur come in. Um, this area traditionally was a cutting garden right from 1908. Mary Gamble had a flower garden back here, a rose garden for cutting. And so for over the years, this has been maintained as a, as a cutting garden. And as I said, it's a nice place to sit, uh, to look at the house and maybe contemplate what it was like here in 1908. Um, somebody asked about the cost and the time it took. Anybody have any ideas how long it took to build the house? I don't know if anybody is, is sending in chat messages, but you know, I asked, I asked guests when they're touring here and I get everywhere from, from 10 years to uh, two years. And it actually took uh, less than 12. Um, that's less than 12 months. It took 11 months to build the house. Uh, unbelievable. Um, now, the furniture actually took longer to build than the house did. Mary Gamble wasn't going to move into her brand new house without the furniture. So uh, now it also may be that the furniture didn't get started at the same time. So in 11 months to build this house, um, it took me almost that long to remodel my kitchen. Um, but you have to keep in mind that in 1908, um, there were probably no building inspectors. There were very few building codes. The, there were no... Um, in employment laws that prevented people from working seven, six or seven days a week. And, and you know, quite frankly, the, um, uh, the, maybe the dedication of workers back then was something different than today. Um, there were not dedicated uh, trades like there are today. So somebody may come into the, the, the job site one day and be doing electrical, the next day they may be doing plumbing. There were, the, the masons were specialized. Um, but so, so, and they, they had a crew of, from what I can tell from historic photos, maybe 15 or 20 people working on the house at a time. Um, so, you know, pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. Now the cost, um, in 1908, it cost about a hundred thousand dollars for this project. Now that's, that's about $50,000 for the house and Believe it or not, all that custom furniture with all the inlay, the spectacular workmanship and materials was about $10,000 $10, for the furniture. The site was about $25,000. Um, the garage alone was $3,700 to build the garage. Now, as a comparison, in 1908, you could build a perfectly respectable bungalow in Pasadena for $2,500 to $3,500. $3,000 would get you a nice house. This cost about $100,000 at the time. So pretty, pretty over the top. Um, I want to say at this point that if, if any of you would like to see more of this house, you are certainly capable or able to go online at gamblehouse.org to our website and click on virtual tour. And you can do the same thing that I was doing. You can, you can steer your way through the house. All of those little circles on the floor were places you can stand. And each one you can rotate 360 degrees. You can look up, you can look down, you can zoom in and out. Um, so if there's an object in a room that you want to look at closely, you can find the closest circle and zoom in on it. Um, so that's all online, free to anybody who logs into the Gamble House website. Um, you know, I, I, I hope you've enjoyed this. It went on a lo whole lot longer than we anticipated. Um, but I, I love answering the questions along the way. Um, if you're ever in Pasadena, oh boy, please come to the Gamble House. We have all kinds of tours after COVID, of course. Um, we have one hour public interior tours. We have one hour public exterior tours. We have in-depth tours that go two and a half hours one is for behind the velvet ropes. You can go where the public typically doesn't go, including the basement. Um, we have one that's tailored specifically for woodworkers. Um, it is uh, called Details and Joinery, and it's led by 
Jim Apexian, a nationally known um, cabinet maker. Um, we have one that is fire and, and a fire and light tour. It focuses on the art glass in the tour led by an art glass artist. Um, we have a neighborhood walking tour that goes for an hour and a half. This neighborhood is rich with green and green homes. Right around the corner is a street called Arroyo Terrace. And on Arroyo Terrace, there's seven green and green homes in a row, including Charles Green's home and studio, all with an easy walking distance. Um, and lastly, if you're interested in learning more about this, you might visit our online bookstore. We have a wonderful bookstore here of uh, craftsman um, oriented books and, and general architectural books. So, um, you know, unless there are any other questions, that's about it for me, but I'll be happy to answer questions for you. Okay. Well, I just wanted to tell you that you um, have gotten amazing reviews. Bravo. Loved it. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> outstanding. Um, Terrific. Great tour and absolutely outstanding. So <laughs> Terrific. <laughs> Best well, yet. we're all pretty enthusiastic about the place. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'll finish up with a couple questions that are sure. in here. Um, let's see. Um, the fire prevention measures, um, were there any from the beginning? No, from the beginning there were not. We do now have fire protection inside. We try to make it as uh, subtle as possible. Um, they um, just recently updated it again. We put it in um, years ago, about 1966, the, the original fire alarm system. There's no sprinkler system in the house that would be too invasive, mm -hmm. um, but there is a fire alarm system and we just recently put in a wireless system. So we've got smoke detectors in all of the rooms and the attic spaces, and it's all tied to central panel and the fire department. So they will be here lickety split if they get an alarm at the Gamble House. Right, right. Um, for, the, uh, for the guild, if you go out there in person, you can actually measure the rooms. <laughs> uh, Jennifer added that. <laughs> there you go. Um, do you know um, if the craftsmen were local or um, did they bring them in from further afield? Um, most of them, I think, were local because um, the, 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 the Greens had worked with other contractors in the past. But just prior, the house prior to this was is half again this size. It's a huge house, the Blacker House in Pasadena. They, they discovered the Hall brothers. And once they teamed up with the Hall brothers, the Hall brothers had... Um, many Scandinavian woodworkers that were available to them. And so the, I think that's where all the fine craftsmanship of the woodworkers comes from. The Hall brothers uh, were the ones that, that hired the, the workers. And, and even after this house, many of the houses, the, the team of those two brothers, the Greens and the Halls worked together in conjunction on the other houses. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, there was someone who mentioned that um, maybe it should be called the Hall and Hall. Uh, <laughs> green and green. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I also feel that the Hall brothers kind of get shortchanged here. Um, you know, um, it, it, we do focus on on the greens, but um, on the tours I give, I certainly give huge credit to the Hall brothers because without them executing the greens designs, there would be nothing. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Um, and the other, and, and of course, that question's coming from a woodworker. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah, this audience would would change the name. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, that one other thing that um, would would need more uh, kind of an in depth answer, and I'm not sure if the person's still on here, but um, there was questions about how the um, uh, how the breadboard edge went around the dining table. And yes. My, my record and where the expansion and contraction takes place. So my guess is that the breadboard came, went around three sides of it. Is that correct? Correct. It, it does not border the seam down the middle. It runs all the way around the other sides of it and it is held in place um, by screws, but the screws, um, the screws are screwed into the, the surface of the dining table, but in the breadboard edge, it's, there's a slot that allows it to slide back and forth. And then those slots are covered by ebony pegs or rectangular pieces. So you don't see the slots, but you will see ebony um, filled in there, but that allows the tabletop to move ever so slightly um, against the breadboard edge. Mm -hmm. Great, great. 
and, um, and, and keep in mind, the breadboard edge is raised slightly above the table. And so the table is actually um, inset into the breadboard edge. So there was never a crack opens up. Okay. Okay, it's hidden. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, great. Um, I think uh, I think that's everything. Okay. Yeah. Well, this has been a real treat. I I, I'm, I never did see how many people joined your your session today, but it was over a hundred. Ed, did you get a count? We were at 715, we were at 112, that was the peak. Terrific, well, you know, I can never give a tour that size here in person. Our tours are limited to, without COVID, we're limited to about 10 people. So, uh, yeah. but, but we do have at times three tours in the house at a, at a time. So I do hope that someday we see some of you out here in Pasadena. Um, there's so much architectural history here. Um, that you know, kind of gets overlooked in Southern California. It's Southern California, it's considered so new, but we have these beautiful structures. We'd love to share them with you. Yeah. Well, you certainly did a good job sharing this one with us tonight, Robert. Thanks Our folks. Thanks. Thanks All the best, coming. stay safe. Thank you so much. And come Jennifer visit. And Robert. Thank you. Given the uh, lateness of the hour, I'm going to adjourn this April meeting of the Minnesota Woodworkers Guild. Terrific. Thank you all of those who are still with us. Uh, I know you've all enjoyed it. I've seen a lot of good comments. I've enjoyed it myself. Thank you very much. And with that, good night and good health. Good night. Good night.